a mini religious studies lecture. Today in India, and indeed around the world, people are crafting clay lamps called dayas. We had one last year when Dr. Shantaram Joshi came to talk about Diwali. They make thousands, hundreds of thousands of these lamps. Beautiful. To mark Diwali, excuse me. Diwali, this word coming from the Sanskrit, Deepa and Vali, a row of lights, and that is what you see in Diwali, most commonly represented by just a truly astounding amount of these Daya lamps. So many decorations. A true time for abundance, even as the winter comes. Diwali, like the light which symbolizes its arrival, interpenetrates cultures. It's a true pan-Indian affair with significance to Buddhists as the anniversary of the Emperor Ashoka's, Akosha's conversion, to Jains as the day Lord Mahavira attained Nirvana, to Sikhs as the celebration of Bandi Chor Divas, a day that over, overlaps with Diwali to commemorate the release of Guru Hargobind from the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, and of course, to the Hindus who celebrate Diwali with a great degree of difference throughout the subcontinent and indeed across the world. For example, in the South, Diwali marks the victory of Lord Krishna over Narakasur, the Anasura, who is kind of like a superhuman or a demigod, usually characterized by a bad temper, foul deeds, not a demon, not a two-dimensional figure as they're often characterized, more complicated than that. In the North, Diwali marks the return of Lord Rama from his 14-year sojourn in the forest Interesting bit, friends. In some tellings of the story of Rama's return in the Ramayana, the intersex and third gendered people had chosen to remain at the forest and wait for Rama's return as they could not abide his command that all men and women of his entourage should go home to wait for him. Impressed by their devotion, he bestowed on them the ability to bless others. In some Hijra and Kanar communities in India, these theologies, these mythologies ground their experience, sense of identity, and cultural expressions. But these are but a few of the many permutations of Diwali. I, I do not have time to go through all of them. <laughs> Hinduism is about the farthest thing from a monolith you can find, friends. No religion is a monolith. This is especially true of Hinduism. But beyond the religious significance of Diwali, it also has a commercial edge. The first of the five days begins with Dantaras, which is generally seen as an auspicious shopping day with many people making for the stores to buy clothes and jewelry and consumer goods, like Christmas shopping here, kinda. Dantaras has a noticeable impact on the Indian economy with retailers seeing huge spikes in their revenue, some reporting 20% of their yearly sales coming from Dantaras, setting the stage for the rest of the holiday with its emphasis on abundance over scarcity, knowledge over ignorance, hope over fear, light over darkness. But nothing is simple in Hinduism. Nothing is simple with Unitarian Universalists either. Pluralism makes for a beautiful, complex tapestry. Regional variations abound. One Indian scholar and anthropologist named Indra Aragam found that practitioners in rural, in rural Tamindu take a much more sober approach to Diwali. While there are still jubilant elements, feasting, fireworks, participants would say that Diwali is a day for the dead and mark the time to commemorate ancestors. Kind of like a Dia de los Muertos, I don't want to do too much in criticism up here. But furthermore, where one lives in India's caste system may also color their interpretation of this time. See, most major Hindu holidays feature enlightened divine beings called suras and devas, defeating divine beings called asuras, which as I mentioned before are sometimes not entirely malevolent, yet are sometimes characterized as demons, not really the case. Some people who are oppressed by the caste system invert this narrative. We see people do this with queer theologies and people finding, uh, finding malign characters who are themselves on the bottom and inverting that narrative. Empathizing with the Asura as misunderstood and falsely malign beings, criticizing this framing of the light over the dark as a means of justifying their oppression. This feels kind of familiar to me. To my Western mind, this feels like a critique of colorism, or at the very least, a critique of dominant narratives and the manner in which they can shape a culture's perspective towards apathy and indifference at the plight of the suffering of our neighbor. We might say they are simply lost in the dark and let that rule our heart. Have we not seen similar examples of such a phenomenon in our lives, in our cultures, those common tropes of lightness entailing purity and goodness and contrasted to darkness with its insinuations of evil and corruption. Such meta-narratives, 
Such meta narratives tend to color just about everything they touch, held in rapture to light alone. We might lose touch with complexity, may lose the beauty of the light to forces like consumerism, turning it into something to be bought and sold like a commodity. The light can't be put in a box. It's not just a bunch of candles or a string on a tree. Consider the transformation of Christmas here in the United States from a day that marks the fulfillment of a prophecy to one characterized by mass consumption and Black Fridays. As a former retail worker, let me just say that Black Friday is the worst. Also, I wonder why we call it Black Friday. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I am personally offended every time I remember that the street lights, which do indeed make our community safer, nonetheless rob us of the majesty of the night sky. I long to see stars again, y'all, but we can only see the stars in the darkness. Right, maybe Camus, what he's saying here isn't some empty optimism. There's a light of summer inside of you and it's so invincible and big and you can do anything. That's not what Camus is saying. Camus is saying that in the midst of winter, I found within me, when I was in a basement hiding from Nazis, that is where I found the invincible summer. And as Diwali is very likely derived from agrarian fire rituals, before Hinduism was consolidated into an idea or Jainism or Buddhism, when people were just trying to survive the night, in a time where we are so surrounded by lights everywhere, you flick, flick, a flick a switch, your power bill goes up, but you can see. This is pretty far removed from the days when people were gathered around a fire for fear of the tiger in the night. And yet, our elevation of the light against the darkness may be worthy of some criticism from a big, big back, backward picture. We do it here, y'all. We have our own theologies of illumination. But I wonder if we can make room for the complexity of the fuller picture, the light not as just the thing which saves us, which it does, but also the light as coming from community, the communal fire, not only the arrival of a Lord to illuminate and save us, but as in some traditions where the light is passed on through the ages, traditions that don't have messianic undertones, but who pass on that tradition anyways, like us, like other traditions, Judaism could be thought of like this with its emphasis on winter lights, the perseverance, against the darkness. All of these are true, and all of these forms are valid expressions of faith. But I invite you into a time of questioning, a love of the light, not to stop loving it, but to love it more thoughtfully, not to be lost in the rapture of easy consumerism and Christmas lights, which I am personally waiting for. This conflict of light and darkness is practically ubiquitous across cultures, across time. It plays tug of war in my own heart. Perhaps you felt it in yours as well. It interpenetrates traditions and makes its way into our economic systems and broader cultures for the simple sake of its commonness. It's in us as well. And I don't mean to lessen the significance of the holiday of Diwali, it's beautiful, but I am personally fascinated by theologies of light and darkness. When we light our chalice, we invoke a mystery beyond mere naming. In our candles, our liturgical choices, call it love, friends or reason, call it justice, call it hope, call it the deepest longings of your own heart, the promise that a tomorrow will come where things are different, call it change, call it cosmos, call it kindness, call it what you will, but bring your own heart to it. This is what we do here. And what I encourage us to do in recognition of other religious holidays, to be mindful that we do indeed step on holy ground, take off your shoes, we walk on others' dreams and around them. But in our own dreams, friends, bring your whole heart, your deepest longing, your greatest love, every name and no name. From whence does hope arise, friends? In the winter, in the cold, together, illuminating those bonds that bind each to all. May you shine brightly, friends, on this Diwali and on all days. And tonight I, inv I invite you into a small spiritual practice, if you mind. Find a candle or a chalice, light it. Be with it for a few moments. It doesn't have to be a long time, five or 10 minutes. Consider the relationship light has as a symbol to your personal spiritual landscape. Where does darkness 
lie in your personal spiritual landscape. A landscape that has no shadows is no landscape. A landscape that has no light can be seen. Tend to both of these friends and shine with that luminous darkness, beautiful, serene, deep beyond naming. <laughs>